today uh, I would like to talk about two uh, diseases uh, which are associated with obesity and obesity. And this is type 2 diabetes and polycystic ovarian syndrome. The uh, definition of diabetes is a level. Uh, it is defined by elevated glucose level, and this elevation in the African population is equivalent to acid lack of insulin, which is of type 1 or human diabetes mortis, or relative insulin, which, you see, uh, which is associated with insulin resistance, and it's a feature of type 2 diabetes in children and adolescents. Uh, insulin is a very important hormone which has major impacts on glucose metabolism and protein metabolism by the body to every uh, cell, so this is the major fuel for cells. And in protein metabolism, it also facilitates incorporation of amino acids into proteins. It has also a direct effect on gluconeurogenesis. Uh, these are uh, diagnostic criteria based on glucose levels uh, for a normal uh, patients, which is for normal people, for patients with PDIDs and patients with IDs based on fasting and postprandial glucose levels. So, uh, basically speaking, if your sugar is 200 or higher than that, uh, postprandially, you have diagnosis uh, of diabetes along with the fasting glucose level of 126 or above. And this is important to um, to understand also the pre-diabetes range because typically this is the time when you need to implement action. It does not need to be pharmacological action, but definitely action which is directed towards weight reduction and change uh, in dietary habits. Uh, type 2 diabetes mellitus is typically defined by increased plasma insulin levels associated with hyperglycemia. So you, you have a buildup of insulin resistance which is not sufficient anymore to maintain normal glucose levels. So when these glucose levels uh, get abnormal, you start having uh, diabetes. Uh, however, in children what is very well described that this is not only your pure straightforward insulin resistance. There is also a factor, a component, as I mentioned before, of a relative insulin deficiency. And this most likely is coming from beta cell dysfunction, which we see in the urgency type diabetes, as well as some plus uh, potential problems with insulin receptor and uh, glucose pathway uh, with regard to glucose transport and also the intracellular insulin activity. Now, we know that we have to diabetes in children. And we see more and more children who are found with abnormal glucose levels. And why is that? And they have shown this very extreme uh, slide with uh, children who are definitely overweight, so we call it morbid obesity, who have the presence of acantosis, nitrogens, and most likely are at very higher risk for developing uh, health issues in the future uh, and perhaps already having them. So this is what we know about the uh, prevalence of diabetes and impaired fasting glucose uh, from 1999-2002 uh, review, which, excuse me, which was published in uh, 2006 by the Duncan uh, group. And uh, the summary indicates that the number of teens with type 2 diabetes in the United States uh, within this time frame is pretty significant, 39,000. Uh, however, the number is significantly higher when you look at these teens with impaired fasting glucose. So uh, definitely concerning for risk uh, for development developing diabetes in the future. When you want to express uh, this in uh, percentages, type 2 was estimated to be 0.5% of adolescent diabetes and uh, impaired uh, fasting glucose level in 11% of uh, people who underwent this uh, investigation. So the question to ask is, is it an epidemic? We have features of epidemic uh, problem because we see an increasing incidence of the disease. 
uh, we know that population-based estimates indicate an about 10 fold increase in incident cases over the past uh, 10 to 15 years. And we know that 8 to 43 percent of all new cases are diagnosed in the United States. The percentage is higher in the United States, which I have in Americans and uh, Native Americans. Uh, very famous uh, summary of diabetes events from 1990 through 95 to 2001. Again, with a feature of epidemic showing a continuous increase in uh, basically every single state in this country. This is what we know about the exact number of potential diagnosed type 2 diabetes in children. This is an age data from 2.9% in 83 up to 31.2% in 2004. Additional feature of epidemic. Prevalence of obesity is, uh, we mentioned, increasing. So there is an increase by 60% from 94 to 2004. And it is estimated that obesity in the United States applies to 20% of adults and 20% of children. So there's definitely a parallel between type 2 diabetes and obesity. Um, with this, we have also an increased risk um, of obesity, and this is very well defined by CDC data, indicating that children born after 2000 have a 70% risk of obesity, and this risk is even higher if one parent is obese, up to 80%. What symptoms are we looking for? Uh, Type 2 diabetes is a slower progressing disease compared to type 1. And maybe it's not as slowly progressing as an adult population. Still, there are certain symptoms and signs that we need to look for before these sugars become significantly abnormal. So number one, it's of course obesity. Number two, I would say it's listed here as number four, but I would say it's number two, acantosis nigricans. A abnormal lipid profile, fasting lipid profile, and with particular recognition of elevated triglycerides and low HDL, uh, which are risk factors for metabolic syndrome, and we are going to talk about this later on. Elevated blood pressure and sleep apnea. Uh, well, this is maybe not as significant as I remember from the time when I was preparing this talk, but definitely this child is significantly overweight and has hyperpigmented thickening of the skin, which is, of course, indicating acantosis nigricans. And this should be looked for in the neck area, in the armpits, also in skin folds, particularly in very obese patients. The next point I would like to make, and I already mentioned this at the very early beginning, is that the course of type 2 diabetes in children can be a little bit different compared to adults. So number one, it does not appear to be preceded by a long asymptomatic period. So basically, if you have a child suspected for having type 2 diabetes, they already have abnormal hemoglobin A1C and they have already abnormal glucose levels, either fasting or, or glucose level measured post, uh, post meal. And uh, this is the uh, cutoff uh, uh, cut uh, levels for glucose um, measurements uh, indicated by ADA, very similar to those that I showed as fasting as postprandial levels. These are uh, fasting levels at two hour after oral glucose tolerance test, the cutoff is the same. Diabetes, fasting, 126 or higher, and two hour post glucose load, 200 or higher, with the same um, uh, normative data for fasting glucose for patients without diabetes and pre-diabetes. Um, the course of type 2 diabetes in children has something probably to do with the mechanism why it happens. So because we have this additional component of beta cell failure in children, the course can be a little bit more aggressive. And one very important point, uh, typically type 2 diabetes in pediatric population, adolescent population applies for puberty. 
when naturally you have a buildup of insulin resistance. And this comes from insulin itself, but it also comes from action of other hormones. And your classical example is growth hormone, which is secreted in higher amounts during puberty. And it has a very well-defined effect on insulin sensitivity, decreasing insulin de sensitivity and creating higher risk for high glucose levels. And this is a very interesting diagram which shows this relationship, not relationship, but connection between a typical mechanism for insulin, uh, for type 2 diabetes due to insulin resistance and this beta cell defect, which is typically assigned to the cause of type 1 diabetes. And what do we know about these two components? So mentioned age and puberty, higher risk of insulin resistance, uh, next, it's obesity, blood pressure, and abnormal lipid uh, profile, which has also direct effect on insulin resistance, buildup of insulin resistance. Then lack of physical activity. Then ethnicity and genetics. We know that insulin resistance uh, runs in families, as well as type 2 diabetes. And also uh, girls, particularly with polycystic ovarian syndrome due to some hormonal changes, which we will discuss in, in a second, um, you have higher risk of insulin resistance. And then moving on to beta cell defect, again, genetic predisposition, autoimmunity, so you may have people who are more predisposed to build up of autoimmune disorders, fat cell toxicity, which comes from primarily from the obesity, glucose toxicity, which comes from hyperglycemia. This is why you have patients with type 2 diabetes who come to see you with DKA, because they have glucose toxicity from inability to uh, metabolize this glucose. Also, intrauterine uh, growth retardation is known to be associated with higher risk of obesity and type 2 diabetes. And this is, I'm not going to go into it, but this is known as a thrift hypothesis. Mm -hmm. yeah. Can you explain the fat cell toxicity? Where did you uh, fat cell toxicity is very primarily to central uh, obesity, which has an effect on uh, the liver, for example. So this is what it stands for. And that leads to a beta cell defect because yes. of the inflammation? Yes, exactly. Exactly. So, for example, in adult population, you see reactive protein as a great marker, but it's not approved or it's not known to be utilized in pediatric patients. Uh, I just uh, decided to show you this summary, not necessarily that it applies to our discussion today, but it gives you some points to differentiate type 1 and type 2 in children in a sort of standard way. So the course is important, the presence of DKA definitely more common in type 1, however with the possibility of ketonuria and DKA in type 2 as well. A family history with definitely very strong family history in type 2. A associated comorbidities, so in type 2 we are looking for PCOS, uh, we are looking for acanthosis nigricans, of course elevated blood pressure, dyslipidemia, additional problems, whereas in type 1 you are thinking primarily about autoimmune problems, thyroiditis, adrenal uh, uh, insufficiency, vitiligo, and celiac disease. As for CPA peptide, which is a marker for uh, insulin reserve in the pancreas, uh, we need to remember that indeed C peptide in type 1 is usually low, but not always, particularly when the disease is diagnosed. Whereas in type 2, you have typically normal or increased C peptide levels. Finally, very interesting situation with antibodies. We tend to think that antibodies are markers of type 1 diabetes, but they may also be reported in type 2. If particularly in the group of GAD65, glutamic acid, glutamic acid, and 65, which is well described in African American patients, and those may be dependent because of the presence of antibodies not only on oral agents, but also on a small dose of long acting insulin. It, a very, it is a very well described phenomenon.
sorry for this. Here, this is an LMS. Um, uh, additional differentiation between type 1 and type 2 summary, uh, pointing out uh, DKA, type 2, 33%, 53%, C peptide, and the presence of, of uh, islet cell antibody in type 2 and type 1, the data from, uh, from 2001. So uh, based on the data published in 2000, uh, we see some uh, in, important points when we think about diagnosing type 2 diabetes. Uh, so mean age is 12 to 14. It's a little bit more common in the girls than the boys. Obesity is very common. It's basically uniform, particularly true for minority groups.